All right, if you'll take your Bible tonight, turn over to the book of Ephesians. The potters had a special for us tonight, but Michelle messed up our plans and got sick. So I I haven't really got an update on her, but I trust you'll uh, remember her in prayer because she's not doing well. And hopefully uh, we'll get them back up here in another time. If you find your place in Ephesians chapter 6, I'm going to look at a passage here. Really, it's not a continuation of our thought last time, but it's the next verse, and it goes along with what we've looked at the last couple of weeks. But let's, before we do that, begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll read. Lord, how we thank you tonight that, again, we can be in this service. And, Lord, it truly is a blessing tonight that we can be together as believers, that we can open up the Word of God. Though we do get to do this week after week, and we are not hindered from a a legal standpoint from doing that, but may we not take it for granted that it is you who gives us liberty. The Spirit of God gives us liberty tonight to meet together and not just be together, but to be able to meet around the Word of God and look to you. Would you lift up the Lord Jesus in our midst tonight? Would you in a real way challenge our hearts? May we be a little different when we leave than when we came in. May there not just be some uh, facts added to our head, but would you minister to our heart tonight for the glory of God? We thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. We, of course, looked at several weeks ago in chapter 5 where the Bible admonishes us as believers to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We, of course, talked about the fact that everything in our life, it is essential that the Spirit of God would use us for nothing eternal could be produced unless the Holy Spirit does it through us. Of course, we know that in chapter 6, we're also told that as we labor as a Spirit-filled believer, as we try to have a testimony, as we try as chapter 6 and the end of chapter 5 emphasizes to raise our family for God, to as a family be a testimony as a believer, that certainly there is going to be a opposition, and that opposition is satanic. There is a spiritual warfare that takes place, and as we on the one hand labor in the power of the Spirit, there is on the other hand an unseen battle, and that battle is between God and the devil. Now we know who wins that battle, but we are ourselves to yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit, knowing that there's a spiritual battle, and then of course we talked about last time the armor that God provides for us to fight that battle. But you'll notice as he finishes that passage on the armor, and we go down to verse uh, 18 of chapter 6, the Bible says, praying always. Now, God certainly has provided effective armor. Certainly the armor that he told me to take, the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation, I mean, he's told me how effective it can be that it could quench the fiery darts of the wicked, that it could, uh, it could stand up against the principalities and the powers and so forth. And yet, even though that armor is effective, God says, praying always. You see, prayer is what energizes the spiritual walk. Now, I say prayer energizes it, not just the act of prayer, but the person to whom I am praying empowers me to be able to effectively use that armor. So do not overlook, in fact, it's not a a side note, it's not just something he throws at the end, but above all, supremely, here it is, praying always with all prayer and supplication, and notice the connection here, in the Spirit. See, not only do I uh, uh, live my Christian life in the power of the Spirit, I witness in the power of the Spirit, but now it says praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication, which is another aspect of prayer for all saints. You know, as I read this and recognize that there is a spiritual battle that is going on, when I recognize that God has told me to not be drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit, I know that He's provided me with spiritual power. I know that I don't have to be afraid of the devil. I just am supposed to be aware of the devil. I'm supposed to know that he has wiles. I'm supposed to be sober and to be vigilant, understanding that he's like a roaring lion waiting to devour those who would let down their guard, and yet God has given me the guard. But he emphasizes supremely here that as we labor in the power of the Spirit, as we move forward, we need to learn something, 
and to get a handle on and to make sure that we take advantage of the resource of prayer. You know, prayer sometimes, as obvious as it is, as important as it is, as elementary as it is, it's still overlooked. You know, prayer often is a last resort. It ought to be the first resort. I mean, it is human nature uh, to try to do things on our own. And I'll admit sometimes God allows us to try it on our own and fail and try on our own and fail. And then finally we decide, well, you know, maybe I ought to get God involved in this. And we go to prayer. Now, God in his mercy and his grace could look down, of course, and say, well, look, you tried it three times on your own. Just go ahead and finish it on your own. That's what we would do. But God's not like us, is he? He says, okay, I understand your weakness, your frailty. Now you know you can't do it. You turn to me. By the way, I can handle it real easy now that you've asked me to take care of it. See, praying always. Now, there's several things that I want to note tonight about prayer, specifically along this line, by no means to be exhaustive. But I do think about a few things when I see here at the end of this passage about armor that he reminds us to pray always in the Spirit. It first reminds me that prayer is essential. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, I can, I can be filled with the Holy Ghost, and certainly as I, a Spirit-filled Christian, uh, I'm going to be effective in my witness. I'm going to be effective in my testimony. But do you know even the filling of the Holy Spirit is related to prayer? Luke eleven thirteen. 13, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit unto them that ask Him? You know, prayer is involved. I'm not going and saying, God, will you indwell me? That's already uh, uh, revealed in the Bible that he indwells me. So what am I asking for? I'm asking for the Holy Spirit not just to be in me. I'm asking for him to come upon me. I'm asking for him to use me in whatever aspect that he would be. So prayer is essential, not just in the filling of the Holy Spirit, but in every aspect of our Christian life. Now, it's just a page or two over. You're familiar with it, but look at Philippians chapter 4. Over to the right in your Bible, just a couple of pages. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Notice the Bible says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. Well, the result of that is the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, isn't it interesting here that God says everything isn't it interesting that he says praying always? If he says pray always and he says in everything, that certainly communicates to me it's essential. John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. For me to pray apart from God, for me to leave him out of the equation, what am I really producing? You see, it's essential. I think about Jesus when he introduced that passage that I just quoted about uh, asking for good things in Matthew chapter 7. Do you remember what he said? So simple, and yet often overlooked. He said, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. He that asketh, findeth. He that, or he that seeketh, findeth. He that asketh, receiveth. Uh, he that knocks, it shall be opened. I mean, what a passage from the Lord Jesus Christ. How much clearer could he be to tell us that if you will come and ask, I'm willing to give. You know, he says, fear not, little flock. The Father knoweth what you have need of before you even ask it. You know, I was talking the other day to my wife about uh, the church. That's not unusual, is it? <laughs> That's what Temple Lot we're talking about. And uh, I've many times uh, used this principle. I mean, we've been here for a number of years, and this is not pro any kind of uh, profound thought. It's just biblical principle, but we sort of operated on this principle all along right from the start, and I've brought it up again and again that the way to build a church biblically is three things. It is preaching, it is prayer, and it's pursuit. You build the church on preaching, that is, around the Word of God. You build it on prayer. Obviously, you look to God for His power, and you build it on pursuit, that is, you go after people. Now, you take those three simple things and that's true in a church to be effective and to do it biblically. That's what you do. And so I was talking to my wife about that, and I says, you know, which of those three, if, if you had to uh, keep just one, which one must you keep? Well, she had the right answer. It's prayer. Now, you think about it. A church can be built without preaching, not as effectively. Not, it's not something you'd want to do for a long time, but you realize you could remove me as the preacher 
and God could keep right on working, and you could, now the preaching could take place individually, but I'm saying as far as the pulpit preaching, you could get by without it for a while. God would want it to be the case, that's the best way, but you could live without it. God can still work. There have been revivals that have taken place without a lot of preaching. Now, you could do away with the pursuit. It's not good. We need to pursue. You've got to go after people. But if you, had, if, if you had to get by for a short time, your church could live without pursuit. But you could not live one Sunday without prayer. You see, if God doesn't work, he might get by without a man preaching. He might get by if we didn't go after somebody for a while, but we must have prayer. See, prayer is essential. But you know, as I look at this and I think about prayer, certainly it's essential, certainly it's something that uh, we must have. But I also look at this in this passage, and I'm, I'm impressed by the fact that not only is it essential, but prayer is energized. Now, Prayer is not something that I work up. You know, uh, I was in a, in a church one time, and they had a prayer meeting before the service every night at the revival meeting. Not a bad idea. It's a good idea. I think they did this before every service at that church. Certainly fine to do that, an organized prayer meeting. And it was kind of a country church, and they had a very um, unique way of organizing the prayer room. Um, just before the service, a guy would come out and he'd yell, prayer room, <laughs> okay, and then everybody would make their way to the prayer room. Now, it was a unique type place in that everybody prayed audibly at the same time. So everybody was in there at the same time they were all speaking. Now, I'm not criticizing that. That's just a way. God can hear a hundred different people praying out loud at one time. I personally couldn't concentrate, but every, I mean, that's just what they were used to. So we're in the prayer room, and of course, what happens is one guy is praying a little bit louder than, than everybody else, because when he quits, that's going to start tapering down. He's the guy that's basically leading it, but everybody's praying along, and so uh, I, I'm listening to this guy next to me pray, and I can't help it because I can't concentrate, so I just start listening to the guy next to me, and so, you know, he asked for a couple of typical things you might expect, God bless the service, and he kind of had a little rhythm to it too, you know, God bless the service tonight and help the preacher as he preaches, and, you know, sort of like that, and he was preaching, and the guy, the loud guy, was preaching and uh, uh, praying, and he was praying out loud, and this guy kind of got about three phrases, and he gave out. He said, God bless the service tonight. Help the preacher tonight as he preaches. Oh, Lord. Oh, God. And he just started, he kind of gave out of stuff, and he just said, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so, now, I'm not individually criticizing that guy, but you know what? If you pray on your own, you kind of give out of stuff to pray. You know, if you're just trying to come up with something, there ain't a whole lot of phrases. I mean, what am I going to do? Now, I don't know about you. I wasn't doing this with other people around me, but many times I've gone to prayer, and I've prayed for my list. I prayed for my list. I've also gone to prayer before when God prayed through me for my list. Now, we can pray, or we can pray in the Spirit. That's a biblical term. Jude, uh, verse 20, again, says, building up yourself in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, that's not mysterious. It's not hard to understand. As a matter of fact, it follows along the same truth that we've been talking about. I can't witness without God. I can't effectively preach, certainly, without God. I can't have a Christian testimony without God and His Spirit empowering me. I can't do anything really that profits. I couldn't be love my wife as Christ loved the church without the power of the Holy Spirit. Nothing that God exhorted me here could I really do if I were drunk with wine rather than being filled with the Spirit. So why would it surprise me to recognize that one of the most important things in my Christian life requires the power of the Holy Spirit? Amen. Now, if I don't know how to witness, what do I do? I go to God, and I say, God, I can't do this. I can't talk to this person. I can't share the gospel. Even if I were to muster up some words, if I had the gift of gab and I talked to them, it would mean nothing unless you fill me and use me and empower me. That's how I witness. I could say, God, I'm going to have a list of standards, and I'm going to keep these standards. i got a list of, of ten rules here. I mean, uh, I'm not going to wear makeup, and actually I keep that one. But, uh, you know... <laughs> I don't drink, and I don't chew, and I don't run with those who do, and I've got my list, and boy, I'm going to do this. Now, I might keep that list, but I don't technically have a Christian testimony unless God, through me, by His Spirit, shows Jesus to the world. I can't do that on my own. But do you realize that that's true 
of prayer? I got to have God to pray to God. You know, prayer really originates in heaven because God has something he wants to do on this earth. I want you to take for a moment and turn over to uh, Romans chapter 8. Now, the truth is laid down here. It's illustrated in a couple of places. But I go to Romans chapter 8, and I look at verse 26. You notice the Bible says here in verse 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Now, what a statement. I don't even know what to pray for except God would get into it. Now, I can listen to your request, and that's legitimate. I might hear your request, and you might pray that God would help you win the lottery. Well, now, as I hear that request, I think to myself, well, you know, there's some violations of scriptural principles about robbing from the poor, which, by the way, is what the lottery does. It exploits the poor and making wealth that is gotten by vanity that's going to be diminished. So you've asked me something. Immediately, I recognize unscriptural. Well, I know what I ought not to pray for, something that's unscriptural, right? There's things that are revealed in the Bible that I can't pray for because you've asked me to pray for something. God's, God will never do anything contrary to his revealed will. However, there are many things that I don't have a direct scriptural principle that applies to, and I don't even know how to pray for it. I know there's a need. I know there's something that needs to take place. And many times when we go to prayer, we're simply trying to dictate to God what he ought to do and how he ought to do it. But, you know, if we go to God, there's nothing wrong with a request, but request with submission that says, God, I don't know how you'll bring it about, but I'm asking you to do this. Now, when you pray in the Holy Spirit, you're not stagnant. You're not depending simply on your own knowledge. You're not depending on simply your ability. Now, there's nothing wrong with emotion. God uses emotion in our lives. And sometimes when, uh, when we're burdened about something, you know, burden does produce emotion. There's no doubt about it. I don't know that I could convince you tonight that if I said, I am very concerned that some of you don't know Jesus and you might die and go to hell for all eternity. Boy, that's awful. Well, now... That might just be my personality, and maybe I'm just not that animated, but it's kind of hard to believe somebody when they tell you somebody's going to be in hell for all eternity, and it just don't seem to move them that much. Emotions matter. There's no doubt. God uses as part of us. Uh, also, somebody can be extreme the other way. But you know, when you go to prayer, God doesn't listen to me anymore just because I work myself up to a frenzy. He doesn't listen to me anymore because I kick and holler and scream and hit, hit the table. But now that doesn't mean that if God's burdening me, I might not become more intense in prayer. He may use my emotions, but you can't get the cart before the horse. The emotions don't impress God. God may give you some as a result. But what the Spirit does is he prays through me. I don't know what to pray for as I ought. Continue in the passage. It says the Spirit itself. And it, self, is simply a grammatical uh, uh a grammatical word has nothing to do with the spirit. He is a person. But the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I wouldn't even know what to say. But he does. He makes intercessions to God with groanings which cannot be uttered. Well, he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit. Well, who searches the hearts? That's God. God searches the hearts. He knows what is the mind of the spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to to the will of God. Now the truth is introduced here that I don't know how to pray, but the Spirit of God prays through me. That ought not surprise me. He has to live through me to be a witness, live through me to be a testimony. He reveals Jesus through me. If I'm going to do something so holy, so important, so impacting to eternity, well, I know I've got to look to God to do it through me. You know, it's just a matter of depending on Him to accomplish what I can accomplish. Now, there's a number of... Uh, thoughts here, but I want you to turn back to Matthew chapter uh, 19 or 18 for a moment. A couple of things about this. I want you to see, first of all, when the Spirit prays through us, He leads. Now, Romans 8 introduces the truth. Like I say, it's illustrated in a couple of other places. But the Spirit of God, when He prays through me, obviously, He leads me in prayer. Now, have you ever prayed for something simply because somebody asks you to pray for it and you, you find yourself maybe continuing to forget it? 
Or you determined, you know, I've got a need. I'm going to pray for that need. And you make it a matter of prayer, and two or three weeks go by, and you kind of forgot to pray for it. When I don't doubt, sometimes the devil can try to uh, distract us, keep things from being in front of us, because if there's one thing he doesn't want you to do, he doesn't want you to pray. I mean, that, that probably calls hell to tremble more than anything is the prayer of the believer. But what God can do in prayer is he can direct. You know, it says he makes intercession according to the will of God. You know, sometimes I might go to prayer and I might have in mind, God, here is a great need. I mean, I've got this prayer request and I'm making this request and I want to see you do it. And uh, maybe you're praying for a direction for your children. Maybe you're praying for a financial need that needs to be met. I mean, whatever the need might be, anything's legitimate. If it's not opposed to God's revealed will, you can ask God for your hair to turn out right tomorrow morning. Even that would be a miracle. But you say, yes, I, I'm going to pray for that, okay? I'm going to pray and ask God to do it. Now, sometimes, don't, don't quit praying. Don't just put it on the back burner. Pray until God answers or until God changes your request. You know, you, you go to God in prayer, and you, you, once you've, uh, I'm not dealing on experience, but when you've, when you've uh, felt it, you can tell it. I mean, you, you understand, when you've gone to prayer and God has met with you, and you begin to pray and your burden changes even as you pray. God, maybe, maybe that's not what you want to do. I mean, the Spirit of God speaks, doesn't he? Read the book of Acts and see how many times the Spirit of God speaks to you. He don't speak to you here. He speaks to you right here. He leads in prayer. Now, let me show you Matthew chapter 18, an often misunderstood verse. But notice chapter 18 speaks about the authority of the church. And it talks about, first of all, discipline in the, in the church. And then in verse 18, it says, Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, I'm not going to develop that completely, but Matthew 16, he says a very similar statement. And he's talking about when, that, when this congregation makes this decision to discipline, it's recognized in heaven. So they've got heaven's attention. Then he says, again, I say unto you, and here's where I want you to focus, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathering in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now, some people have taken verse 19 to mean that I've got a request that I want to take place. If I can get a friend to come over and say, you and I both are going to pray about this thing. You know, I've just determined that I want, my, I'm, I'm, I want my salary to be doubled next year. Will you pray about that with me? Now, God may want your salary to be doubled next year. I mean, that's le legitimate if you're willing to be submissive to God's will. Maybe you only make $100 a week. I mean, maybe it needs to be. But you go to a friend and say, you pray about it, I pray about it, and we're going to claim Matthew 18, 19. Well, it's not enough. to See, the only reason I'm praying is because you asked me to pray. I'm not praying because God led me to do it. But he's not saying just because some two people pray. Notice there's a phrase here, as touching anything. There's something drawing them together. There's something that makes both of them pray for the same thing. It's a central person. It is the Holy Ghost. You see, uh, a church, it can happen two or three are gathered in his name. That's the, the simplest form of a church. Two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, and the Spirit of God comes in the midst of them, and he's leading all three, and he's interested in the same direction, and all three get burdened about the same issue, you know, God can do some miraculous things. There's been plenty of testimonies where people, churches, have been uh, surrounded by property and nowhere to go, and some guy next to them, uh, I think of one place in Ohio where this happened, a guy next to them hated the church, hated everything they stood for, had never had a good attitude about it, wouldn't sell them that property for anything, no way they were going to sell it, his kids didn't like the church, there was nowhere else from to go. There was like a railroad track on one side and a highway on the other, and they were boxed into a triangle. And that guy would never sell them that property, and they desperately needed it. Well, they prayed. And you know, when they prayed, it took a while, but eventually God miraculously gave them that property for a very low cost, not even jacked up. I mean, that's just one incident. It's happened plenty of times. I heard about uh, a church, I understand it's a true story, uh, a bar uh, was going to build right next to them. In fact, it did build, and they didn't like that bar being there. They fought it, didn't want it there, and tried to keep it. They built it anyway. So that church prayed 
that God would get rid of that bar. Well, do you know within a short period of time, some kind of natural disaster took place and, and destroyed that bar. I mean, to the, it couldn't even be used anymore. It was gone. The bar owner sued the church for praying for his bar. And do you know the church put on a countersuit and the judge says, I believe the bar owner believes in prayer more than the church. <laughs> they claimed they weren't responsible. Now, you understand God can do miraculous things if he's in the middle of it. Now, how do, you get in the, how do you let God get in the middle? You know what that happens? You've got to open your heart to him. You've got to listen to his voice. Yes, you go to prayer. Now, don't wait till God gives you some kind of revelation for you go to prayer. But my point is when you go to prayer, go to prayer and, and let distractions be removed. Get focused on who it is you're praying to, not just what you're praying for. It's far more important to be focused on who you're praying to than what you're praying for because God can do anything he wants to do. If you, God, you know, I've got some requests today, but I'm far more interested in fellowshipping with you and getting to know you, and I've got a list here I want to pray about, and you know what the needs are, and I'm going to start praying through this list, but God, what do you want to do? I mean, I'm not trying to be overly simplistic, but we need to be yielded to him in prayer. I remember as a, as a young person, and this could happen to me this week, but I, I remember going to prayer, and I hear these preachers talking about the need to pray. And I thought, well, I agree with that. If we're going to see any spiritual progress. We need to pray. And I know about 10 people that are lost, and I've got some friends that are, that are lost, and uh, I certainly know that I want God to lead me and all this type of thing. And so I'd go to prayer, and about, about a minute I was done with that list. And I thought, how in the world do these people go pray for periods of time that I'm here? And they don't follow an experience. There's no time element involved. But I also remember as a young person thinking to myself, you know, I, I, I go to prayer and I go through this list and I felt some pressure in a sense from hearing preachers that you got to pray this long. I mean, they'd give illustrations about some guy who prayed eight hours a day and I just couldn't even imagine how that took place. But you know, eventually I started going to prayer and say, well, you know, the time's not important. I'm just going to go to prayer and I'm going to talk to God. And I still remember the first time that I got up from prayer, I, I was just 18 years old, and I just was learning new things, and I got up and recognized how long I had been praying and had absolutely no idea that I'd been praying that long because I wasn't watching the clock. I was listening to God. Hey, don't, don't follow an experience. It has nothing to do with time, but it does have something to do with listening to the Lord. You know, we're, we're busy people. We're distracted people, but our prayer needs to be in the Spirit. I need God to pray through me. So he is going to lead. I'll tell you what else the Holy Spirit does. He pleads. Turn over to John 14. Now John 14 has two different aspects of prayer that I need to recognize. And it still has to do with God energizing my prayer. He says in chapter 14 and verse 13, Jesus said this, Whatever you shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth in the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you, I will not leave you comfortless. You know, the comforter, the Spirit of God, that means someone who is called alongside to help. Jesus prayed the Father, and he sent the comforter. You know, what if you lived on earth with the disciples? What if the disciples had a need? You know what happened when they came upon one who was, um, had multiple demons, and he would cast himself into the fire, and they, couldn't, they went and tried to cast out the demon, and it didn't help? And they forgot themselves. They thought, well, man, we've been casting out demons. We've been pretty good at it. I don't know what's wrong now, but this one we can't. And the father was perplexed. The Pharisees were laughing. And Jesus says, what's wrong? They said, this father brought us this boy, and we tried to cast out the demon, and we couldn't do it. Well, Jesus said, this kind cometh not but by prayer and fasting. Now, don't think for a moment that when you fast, you're impressing God with not eating. Fasting has nothing to do with meriting God's favor. I've afflicted myself, and I'm going through this terrible difficulty. Surely God will notice this. If he, when you pray, you're praying in Jesus' name and his merits. So what is the fasting? The fasting is not for God. It's for you. 
I mean, sometimes when you deny the flesh, it takes that to get for God to get your attention, for your heart to be open. And that doesn't mean that every day you have to fast and every time you have to, but he did say, this kind cometh not but by prayer and fasting. It was a difficult need. They needed God to do something. Now, they could have just talked directly to Jesus, right? They could have said, Jesus, we got a problem. This boy's father, and of course, Jesus met the need. But I don't have him right now, do I? He's not right beside me on the earth like he was with those disciples. But if Jesus meant anything, he meant, I'm physically leaving, but I'm not leaving. I'm physically leaving, and of course, he sent the Holy Spirit, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it's one God. He basically said, I'm leaving physically, but spiritually, I'm coming to indwell with you. So I can still ask. In this passage, I find out something about prayer. Prayer is in Jesus' name and in the power of the Holy Spirit. See, really, technically, I pray to the Father. You know, the Lord's Prayer, our Father, which art in heaven. That wasn't a prayer to be prayed per se, but a model prayer. Our Father, which is art, art in heaven. So we pray to the Father. We pray, according to this passage, in Jesus' name. And that doesn't mean just tagging a little statement at the end. It meant my whole prayer is on the merits of Jesus. You better be glad it is. If it was on your merits, you don't have any grounds. God, I'll tell you, I've been so faithful to you. and I, I've read my Bible like I really should, and I, I'm such a good soul winner, and I'll tell you, I hardly ever sin. I believe you ought to listen to me. You bring a prayer like that, and you'd be better off to ask Mr. Blanton. I mean, you know, just didn't gonna, it isn't going to go past the ceiling. There's no, no merit of your own, but when you come in Jesus' name, you say, Jesus, you're pleading my case. Yes, I'm coming and asking something very bold, but it's on the grounds of the blood of Jesus Christ. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. We come boldly before the throne because the Spirit of God does the pleading for us. He makes intercession with groanings which cannot be uttered. You know, if I wanted to win somebody to Christ, what do we do? We make ourselves available, don't we? Yes, God uses my mouth. He might use my intellect. He might use my feet to get me there. He talks about the beautiful feet of the soul winner. But ultimately, he uses me as a vessel to reach others, and he gets to glory. Do you know prayer is no different? But on the other hand, you say, well, good. The Holy Spirit does the praying. I don't have to. But you know what God's going to use? He's going to use your burden, your desires, the providential exposure that you've had to needs, what you might have heard something nobody else heard, I mean, Abraham, well, God said, I'm going to tell Abraham about what I'm going to do in Sodom for one reason. I want him to pray. God exposes us, lets us be ever, whoever we are. God has something for us. What a ministry prayer really is. You know, it's great for folks to serve, and I hope you have a heart to serve. Service is good, but sometimes we overlook one of the most important things that could be done is prayer. I heard about a, a great soul winner one time. I won't even mention his name so you don't lose focus. But this guy had, had built a great church and was known as a tremendous soul winner. And come to find out, when he would come back to his home church, he was going on a lot of meetings and stuff and preaching. But he would come back to his home church. He would go by and he would just, there was a little house, a little apartment house. And he would go knock on that door and he'd sit on the porch because it took like 10, 15 minutes for the person to answer the door. So he tells the story. He said, I'd go, I'd knock on the door, I'd knock good and loud, and I'd sit there and I'd wait. Every once in a while, I'd have to get up and knock twice. But he said, I'd sit there and wait, and about 10 or 15 minutes, he'd hear a creaking and an and a opening and a rattling, and he'd open it up, and this old lady, who looked like she's about 150, could barely move, said, oh, I'm so glad to see you. Come on in. He'd come in and he'd sit down and tell her about the souls that had been saved and the way God had moved and all of the things that God had been doing. And he told her because he knew something about her. He knew that while he was out preaching daily for hours, she would pray for him. Nobody knew her name. Nobody knew about her. That's the way God would have it, by the way. Amen. Behind the scenes. Now, that story, I've... I didn't know the man personally, but do you think when, when you get to heaven that he's going to be ever any other father up in the line than she is? 
I mean, she's got a reward that nobody knows about, but when, I mean, she meets God, what a ministry she had in prayer. I mean, prayer is essential. Prayer is energized. And then very quickly, prayer is eternal. You know, we go to prayer, and I'm not saying every time you say a prayer. There might be some that we say totally in the energy of our flesh. I'm just totally selfish. I'm totally focused on myself, and I'm just going to go say some words. I hadn't even thought about who I'm praying to. I'm just, that's not much different than what Jesus meant when he said vain repetition like the heathen do. I mean, there can be vain repetition for the Christian. By the way, Jesus was exhorting those that knew him and loved him, don't fall into that trap of just vain repetition. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying the same prayer. But again, it's not what you're praying, it's who you're praying to. But if I truly pray, God is empowering me, he's leading me in prayer, he's pleading the prayer, I'm, I'm yielding myself to him, I'm using my own tongue, my own burden, my own providential exposure, I'm thinking about what I'm praying, and yes, I'm opening my heart, and I'm asking God to speak and lead, and I pray. Do you know what you pray as far as I can see in the Bible, there's a couple of different passages that indicate this, that prayer lasts forever. I want you to turn to Revelation. We didn't touch this this morning. You got most of it, but we didn't touch this one. But Revelation chapter 5, we were in this chapter. And he talks about here the redemption of the earth and the people. And notice this, when John sees this vision in verse 5 and or chapter 5 in verse 8, it says, When he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. In this heavenly scene, the elders, of course, a picture of the saints, and they represent the church and possibly Israel, but the saints of God. They stand before God with vials in their hand. God makes a, a note to John, listen, on earth, you don't even know where they are. As far as man's concerned, they prayed, they're done, it's over. But as far as God's concerned, they were that significant, they're in, that important, that they're still an entity. They're still a prayer. God has kept that prayer. You know, anything that God does is eternal. If he saves a soul, it's eternal. He gave his word, his word's eternal. Even the judgment of God, his fire is called eternal fire. Everything God does is eternal. There's nothing temporal with God. So if God prayed through me, that prayer is so significant, it shows up in eternity. Now that impacts me. To think that I'm doing something so important, man, I, and I wouldn't minimize anything I do for God, but boy, we just want a soul to Christ. Isn't that thrilling? And it is. But according to God, we just got a hold of heaven and ask him, God to do something, and he's going to do it. That's significant too, and it's significant in eternity. Now, how do I practically? Yes, God's got to use me. Spirit of God's got to work through me. So what do I do? Well, I pray. You know, the Bible says pray without ceasing. You know what that is? That is a constant communication with God. No, none of us are going to be on our knees for hours and hours a day. It's just not likely that many of us have the ability to do that. Could be some exceptions, but for the most part, prayer is going to be something we must plan. You got to plan to pray. We got to have purpose in our prayer. Why am I praying and who am I talking to? But then also, sometimes we pray and we're, it's not our prayer time, but we don't just turn it off. God, I want to communicate with you all the time. I don't just tuck that away and say, I'm going to pray about that. I want to be in a spirit of prayer. How is our prayer life today? You know, your prayer life is probably directly correlated to your spiritual life. I doubt, I doubt any of us could say, God, I don't have some room to grow when it comes to prayer. Well, I dare say that's probably true in about every aspect of our spiritual life, isn't it? But what a simple thing to begin to simply open my heart up before God. You say, well, boy, that sounds complicated. That sounds difficult. Do, do I need, is there some little, little thing I can read before I start? Or Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. Even a child could understand that, can't they? 
When you pray, pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You don't have to pray that phrase, but you start off praising God. You tell God how wonderful he is. You remind God that he's made this earth and all things that therein are, and you brag on God about who he is. In the spirit, you've got God's ear. Then it says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Well, I know what I need to pray about. God, I want your will to be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Yeah, there's some sorry politicians here that are trying to hinder the gospel. I want you to stop that. There's lost neighbors across the street that are going to hell. I know you're not for that. I've got children that are not walking with God, or they are, and I want them to keep walking with God. I know you're for that. God, I know I need to grow spiritually and need open doors of opportunity. I mean, the kingdom is pretty, God's revealed a lot of stuff to pray about. But then there's also some things, God, I don't know what your will is on this, but there seems to be a need. I got a relative who's sick. Maybe I'm sick. I've been told by the doctors I'm not going to live. Is it your will? God, if it's your will to doctors, you know more than they do. I mean, of course, it's, it's inexhaustible what we might ask God. But ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Of course, we go on through that, and we see the fact that we confess our sin, forgive us our debts, and so forth. All of that's involved in prayer. But we pray, as the Bible exhorts, in the Spirit. And I trust God will exhort us to do that. Let's have a word of prayer tonight. Lord, what a privilege tonight to go to you in prayer. Lord, like all parts of our Christian life, there's failures, there's weaknesses. We need to grow. It's not a matter of waiting until we're at a certain place spiritually. We can start tonight to seek you and ask you and know that you hear. You meet us in our ignorance. But Lord, may we be informed tonight that we need you even in the matter of prayer. Work through us, yield us, burden us, and may you get the glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing an invitation song tonight. If there's a need in your heart, if you need to find a place of prayer tonight at the altar, we'd invite you to come during this song. If you don't know Christ, we'd love to take a Bible and show you how to be saved. As we sing 317. <laughs> Well, we're going to go ahead and dismiss tonight in prayer, and I'm going to ask John Joe Salazar if he'll pray for us. Lord, it's been so good to be in your house today, Lord. Just heard great preaching, Lord, and we thank you for the truth of this message tonight, Lord, that we just leave out so many times. We can go to you in prayer for anything and everything as long as we pray in the Holy Spirit. We pray that you'd help us to learn that and do better this week, and as we go our separate ways, Lord, keep everyone safe tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.